America's southern mountains, the ancient backbone of the United States known as Appalachia. 80,000 square miles of high ridges, steep hollers, and river valleys. Sprawling over a dozen states, Appalachia stretches a thousand miles from Pennsylvania to Alabama. As big as these mountains are in reality, they and their legendary inhabitants loom even larger in the imagination. Long isolated from mainstream American society and with a distinctive culture all their own, the southern mountain people have been portrayed as hillbillies and backwoods buffoons or as romanticized heroes of lost innocence and virtue. But behind all the cliches is a much more intriguing reality. These are the people who forged this nation in unknown and unsung ways. They're hard-fighting, freedom-loving, fiercely independent and faithful, the very characteristics we hold most dear as a nation. This is the real story of True Blue American Originals. I'm Billy Ray Cyrus. When you grow up in a small town in the foothills of the Appalachians like I did, it doesn't take long to realize that some folks can't separate fact from fiction when it comes to Southern mountain culture. That's what this show's all about. The reality behind those stereotypes that people have about my home and my people. Here come the revenues. One of the most indelible characters in American folklore is the moonshiner. He's usually portrayed as a simple fellow, skunked of his own liquor. But the truth is much more complex. Going back 300 years, moonshine whiskey has deep roots in American history. This potent, clear liquid has come to symbolize tradition, rebellion, and survival. And few people embody those traits more than this man. White lightning, brown mule, I've heard it called, and painter piss, who shot Sally. They call it a whole bunch of names. But I beware of anybody that comes around me wanting to know if I've got any white liquor. That word offends me. And anybody that says that, you better be aware of them because it could be the law. Meet a living legend among mountain men, Popcorn Sutton. He's been distilling whiskey in the North Carolina backcountry for 60 years. Popcorn may look like a character out of central casting, but make no mistake about it, he's the real deal. How many runs of liquor I've made in my life? Well, there ain't no way I could count it. I've made more runs of liquor than our whiskers on my jaw. Popcorn's prized liquor is made from a deceptively simple recipe. Mix pot. corn, water, yeast, and sugar. Let the mixture ferment until a mash is formed. Heat the mash up in a copper steel. Cool it down and turn it back to liquid and you've got shine. Perfecting this craft has been Popcorn's life calling. It's just something that come up in me since I was a little old kid. You know, a lot of people, they dream of what they're gonna have year, years later and while they go do this and do that. My thing was liquor and that's just what I done. Moonshining's a Sutton family tradition and so is defying the law. Popcorn's grandfather was jailed for the crime back in 1929, and Popcorn's been busted twice over the years. It's, it's a heritage. I mean, that's all there is to it. It's a family thing, and, it, and it's just handed down years and years and years. Some people do have that, and, you know, in the back of their head, and, and that's all they know. That's what they know. Today, with legally available alcohol, both plentiful and cheap, moonshining's a dying business. Even so, the region's few remaining moonshiners are staying true to what they consider a fundamental right. It's the lore of the area. I had a man tell me one time that his family would be making white liquor even if it was a hanging crime. Even if they get caught, and, and some of them get caught 
you know, three, four, five times, and, and just continue on doing it. Uh, and they're probably never gonna stop doing it. Uh, it's just, it's in their blood and not gonna stop. In April 2007, authorities in Maggie Valley, North Carolina, raided the remote Sutton place and found a steal and 18 gallons of whiskey. Popcorn was arrested for the third time, fined $3,000 and sentenced to two years probation. The more liquor they catch you with, the more fines will be because you got to pay tax on every drug they catch you with. Like I told somebody a while back, if they want to know anything about the liquor laws, they can ask me simply because if they've ever made one, I broke it. Some look at it as part of our heritage, as part of the culture, and others are ashamed of it. But for an awful lot of people, it was a way of life. It's what people did to support themselves. Moonshine was not an American invention, but in the earliest years of the United States of America, making it a statement of rebellion certainly was. When immigrants settled the Appalachian frontier in the early 1700s, they carried with them centuries-old recipes for usquebaugh, or whiskey, from Northern Ireland and Scotland. Moonshine, as it came to be called, became an integral part of life in these southern mountains. Everybody drank it. Rum was the favorite in the early colonies, but when the Scottish settlers moved over, it was whiskey, water of life. As the Scots-Irish frontiersmen spread south through the wilderness, one of the few possessions they brought with them on the difficult journey was distilling equipment. This water of life was drink, medicine, and currency. For people who lived up in the hills, they could either grow this corn, sell bushels of it at the market, or it was much easier to distill it down into these, you know, small containers, easier to transport, and you make a whole lot more money. To the fledgling American government, the moonshine trade represented potential revenue. In 1791, Treasury Secretary Alexander Hamilton slapped a sweeping tax on whiskey production to relieve the Revolutionary War debt. We had just fought a war to get over the taxation without representation from England. And the first thing a new government did was put a tax on something. And that just went against an awful lot of people. In what became known as the Whiskey Rebellion, settlers from the hills of western Pennsylvania rose up in protest. The newly formed nation had its very first ride on its hands. When the tax was lifted in 1802, whiskey once again flowed from mountain steels. But the relationship between the government and mountain folk was scarred forever. By the 1850s, whiskey was a mainstay of the backcountry economy. More than 90,000 gallons of moonshine a day was being produced by farmers and mountain men just looking for a way to get by. In 1862, the federal government imposed heavy new taxes on the distillers to help bankroll the costly Civil War then raging between the states. Armed federal revenue agents were sent in to take down the moonshiners. In defense, the hill folk tapped a weapon from their ancient past. The clan structure that had served their ancestors so well in the border wars of Scotland and in Northern Ireland. You have an obligation to look at things from the bottom up. In other words, define your loyalties with the people around you and then address the issues that are above you. I think that's one of the key characteristics of this culture. In just four years between 1877 and 1881, revenuers seized 5,000 steels and made 8,000 moonshine-related arrests. Moonshiners took their operations underground and their neighbors closed ranks. There was a defensive network. If a posse came to town, word spread quickly, and the moonshiners, when needed, would band together. Now, generally, the hills kept them safe. It was just difficult to find them. It wasn't long before this widespread defiance of authority produced a symbolic figurehead. 
His name was Lewis Redman. Lewis Redman is probably the most famous American folk hero of whom you've never heard. Redman was a small-scale moonshiner in the hills of South Carolina. Son of a Scots-Irish farmer and distiller, Lewis and his family were on the local revenuers' hit list. What set Redman on his journey happened in March of 1876. He knew there was a warrant out for his arrest, and on a mountain trail, he met a group, including a federal marshal. When the marshal tried to arrest Redman without the warrant, a gunfight broke out. Redman shot and killed the marshal. He fled to the only safe place he knew, the mountains. Posses of bounty hunters were sent on his trail. Over the next two years, Redmond was captured twice, but escaped each time. He even staged daring raids of his own to recover confiscated property from corrupt officials. As he continued to elude and outwit the revenuers, Redmond's story found its way into big city newspapers. His legend grew. A best-selling dime novel remade the rough mountain man into a romantic hero. The people's frustrations with the revenue service found a home in Redmond. He became the people's champion. After five years on the lam, Redmond's luck ran out in 1881 when police raided his hideaway and shot him 18 times. But the tenacious outlaw somehow survived to spend two years in federal prison Pardoned by President Chester Arthur, Redmond emerged a free man and a living symbol of the fight against unjust authority. A perceived injustice will bring about a response, and that's what Redmond was doing. He wasn't fighting for a cause. He wasn't fighting for whiskey. He was fighting for his rights. The federal revenuers never did manage to rid the southern mountains of moonshine whiskey. Throughout the 1800s, the southern hill folk kept right on practicing the ancient art of moonshining in clandestine stills. And then on January 16, 1920, the backwoods tradition was catapulted to a new level of prominence. Prohibition, the national ban on alcohol, fueled the fire under thousands of stills. For the next 13 years, a thirsty nation caused the price of liquor to rise tenfold and produced a booming business in Appalachia. But when prohibition was repealed in 1933, the lucrative moonshine trade began a long decline, drying up many mountain stills for good. In the 1960s, many moonshiners turned to a new illegal substance that promised high profits, marijuana. A growing demand for pot in faraway cities gave birth to a new cottage industry. Appalachia, with its damp, mild climate, rich, well-drained river bottom land and outside haulers, proved to be the ideal site not only for clandestine stills, but also for growing marijuana. There's a lot, a lot more money in it. And not only that, it's easier to do. Uh, you know, you plant it, you fertilize it, you water it, and you watch it. And then you harvest it. In the 1970s, revenue agent Jack Powell began tangling with moonshiners who had been lured into the new trade. He busted many mountain men who had a hard time letting go of their liquor-soaked past. Just behind his house, he had a half an acre garden. The corn was up six or eight or 10 feet high, and, but the marijuana was, was, uh, was, uh, was much higher. That night we came back, we got a, some uh, leaves, it was as big as my hands. I'm standing behind the side of the hedges, and he gets out, and he's got his arms full of moonshine whiskey. By the 1980s, growers were pumping huge amounts of cash into the economy. Just like the moonshine wars of the past, many locals just kind of looked the other way. 
the hardest thing for me to get to understand when I came to Eastern Kentucky is just how how clannish these people were and, and looking at if you weren't one of them, you were an outsider. That complicity emboldened the growers and helped Appalachia's marijuana trade grow into big business and a dangerous blight on mountain culture. Dawn in the hills of eastern Kentucky, but a full-scale invasion by state and federal law enforcement is already underway. It's late September, harvest time for marijuana, Kentucky's number one cash crop. Appalachia is the epicenter of the country's marijuana industry. Nearly $4 billion a pot is grown each year in this cash-strapped region where the average household income is less than $8,000 a year. The Daniel Boone National Forest is Appalachia's dope growing hotspot. Estimates are that more than half the marijuana produced in this country is grown on fertile, remote, and free national forest land. Over the years, Appalachian growers have developed strains that are prized for their potency, up to double the THC content of marijuana grown in Mexico. These guys are good growers. You know, they may think that there's a bunch of hillbillies out here, but I'll tell you one thing, they can sure grow some fine marijuana. Though that doesn't equate to the fact that they're breaking the law. I have no respect for that. In 1998, the Forest Service, FBI, ATF, State Police, and the National Guard combined forces to challenge the mountain growers. The pot is grown in small, well-disguised plots that can only be detected from the air. Once the sharp-eyed spotters have ID'd a patch, they call in ground forces to destroy the crop. Over the last 10 years, dozens of agents have been injured or killed on backcountry bus by an ingeniously gruesome array of defenses. Just this year alone, we've had officers caught in fish hooks with fishing line at eye level. And also we've had um, pipe bombs. We've had explosive devices that's, that were located inside a marijuana pot. For the officers who risk their lives, this deadly cat and mouse game isn't about sheltering the local economy. It's about doing what's right. Everyone that you see today on, on this team, this is our home. This is very important to us. And it's more than just us doing our job. It's us trying to improve, you know, this area where our children are being raised and where our families live and where our, our history is from. Since 1998, the task force has made 2,000 arrests and destroyed 13 million marijuana plants worth an estimated $26 billion. But like the moonshiners of old, Appalachia's pot farmers are a tenacious bunch. Well, you know, I would like to say that we get everything that's grown, but I'd be lying to you. I would say, honestly, we probably get between 40 and 60% of what's actually grown outdoors. For the past 200 years, these mountains have harbored an unending flow of illegal trade while fostering an unyielding belief in keeping the government out of reach. And that's produced a centuries old fight that shows no signs of ending anytime soon. Fierce and independent, the toughness of the mountain men was bred in the bone. Most Appalachian hill folk can trace their kin back a thousand years to the mountains and moors of Scotland, where fending off the harsh environment and armies of foreign invaders was a way of life and death. The lowlands of southern Scotland, a region of rocky hills and poor soil along the border with England, from 1400 to 1600, it was a bloody war zone. The English invaded repeatedly, trying to bring the independent Scots under their direct rule. The lowlanders, farmers and warriors bound together in tight-knit clans, fought back, refusing to bow to foreign authority. This struggle to survive forged a fiery, resilient culture. It was formed at the clan level, 
the local level. Part of it was the topography, which is not that different than what you see in the Appalachian Mountains today. Um, and it was formed by constant struggle. This endless cycle of violence went on for centuries. Finally, in 1610, King James I of Britain devised a plan to deal with the Scottish border folk. He gave them farmland in Northern Ireland where they could fight instead with Britain's troublesome Irish population. But a century later, life was no better for these folks, now known as Scots-Irish for the addition of their adopted home turf. They were still fighting with the Irish over land, and they felt alienated and embittered toward Britain. They were ready to pull up roots. And they were pretty rough hewn by then. Used to being displaced, they were no longer completely Scottish after generations. And they weren't integrated with the Irish because the Irish, the indigenous Irish were their enemies. Famine and crop failures in Northern Ireland sparked a mass exodus to the New World between 1720 and 1775. More than a quarter million Scots-Irish crossed the Atlantic. Most arrived in Philadelphia or other Delaware River ports. They were told it was a land of opportunity, wide open spaces, uh, they would have liberty, there was democracy. And when they got out there, they threw off the old world. The poor and uneducated arrivals were met with a chilly reception by the English, Dutch, and German settlers. In their view, the Scots-Irish were nothing better than a rowdy, uncouth horde. Shunned by established colonial society, the immigrants set out for the back country. By 1754, they were pushing deeper into the Appalachian wilderness, America's western frontier than any settlers had before. But the land they claimed had inhabitants, the Iroquois and Cherokee, who didn't take kindly to the aggressive newcomers. The settlers didn't have much choice but to fight. Battles continued over 20 long years, and the settlers would become experts in Indian fighting tactics, learning well how to blend seamlessly into their surroundings and sneak up on their foes. After thousands of deaths on both sides, the mountain men finally won their backwoods real estate. They were now masters of the wilderness, transformed from Scots-Irish immigrants into hardcore Americans. In the 1760s, a group of intrepid mountain men crossed the Appalachians and settled along the Watauga River on the wild western side of the Great Smoky Mountains. The us. In 1772, they established the Watauga Association and declared themselves independent and free from British rule. These men sat down and put on paper the basis of rules that would govern their community. And they were the very first to do so on the American continent, four years before the Declaration of Independence. Very well. The area's British land agent ordered the Watagans to leave. They were squatting on territory that still belonged to the Indians. He was ignored by these so-called over-mountain men who were safely located hundreds of miles away from the nearest British Army post. When the war broke out with the British in 1776, the hill folk were far removed from the main action and still preoccupied with their own fight against the Indians. 
In August 1780, the American rebel cause was in its darkest hour. The picture was very grim. The news was bad all throughout the colonies. Victory seemed like a fleeting dream. General Washington himself said, the country stands on the brink of a precipice. The British, after crushing the Continental Army in Charleston, South Carolina, swept north where they met little resistance from crumbling rebel forces. 1,300 redcoats, commanded by Major Patrick Ferguson, marched inland to wipe out lingering pockets of resistance in the back country. Ferguson sent a threatening message to the over-mountain men. And that message said, if you do not desist your opposition to the British arms, I shall march this army over the mountains, hang your leaders, and lay waste your country with fire and sword. Now, that's not the type of message that you could give to people of the temperament who has carved a life for themselves out of this wilderness without them getting upset and taking some action. The call for help went out, and a 1,000 volunteers poured from the hills and mustered at the Watauga settlement of Sycamore Shoals. Once the militia decided they were going after Ferguson, they let nothing get in their way. And they made a very difficult trip over the mountains. Wearing clothes stitched from animal hides and carrying only their hunting weapons, the over-mountain men raced to confront the British Army. After two weeks of hard march, the mountain men located the British Army, which was camped out on a low ridge called King's Mountain. Ferguson encamped on top of the mountain, apparently thinking that the wooded and rocky sides would provide a natural defense. But of course, <laughs> it worked just the opposite. At 3 o'clock in the afternoon of October 7th, 900 backwoodsmen silently circled the base of King's Mountain and then went on the attack. It wasn't organized strategy, but it wasn't a free-for-all either. They understood that Ferguson was on top of the mountain, and they knew what the escape routes were, and they blocked those. But basically, it was, let's surround him and go up the hill. The British were armed with standard issue smooth bore muskets, effective only at close range. The outnumbered rebels carried long barrel hunting rifles, slower to load, but with twice the accuracy. Fire! The British troops fired in unison, then marched forward in well formed ranks with bayonets mounted. Employing these tactics, Major Ferguson inadvertently sealed his own fate. He was used to military tactics that were designed for fighting on the open fields of, uh, of Europe and fighting in this Indian style, which is exactly what the Overmountain men were trying to do. This was a guerrilla style of fighting that uh, he was unfamiliar with, and that probably led to his defeat. I got something for you, Steel. Just one hour and five minutes after the firing began, the battle was over. The British were decimated, 150 dead, 800 taken prisoner. Only 28 backwoodsmen lost their lives. Before the battle, Major Ferguson had vowed that even God couldn't get him off King's Mountain. His prophecy proved accurate, but not quite in the way he predicted. He tried to break through Patriot lines on horseback, and when he did, he was spotted. Robert Young, as many men did, had nicknamed his rifle the same nickname he called his wife. He took careful aim at Ferguson and was heard to mutter, we'll see what sweet lips can do. Pulled the trigger, and Ferguson's oath came true. To this day, Ferguson is still on the top of King's Mountain. 
Robert Young was my fifth great grandfather. Against all odds, without any orders or assistance, the ragtag mountaineers had wiped out a well-trained army and stopped the British advance through the Carolinas dead in its tracks. The effect is very much a ripple effect. It simply passed the word around like wildfire. These boys beat them. They didn't just beat them, they whipped them. We can win. One year later, General George Cornwallis surrendered all British forces at Yorktown, Virginia. For the next 100 years, the Appalachian settlements, isolated both by the terrain and a long-standing distrust of outside authority, evolved into a vibrant, self-reliant culture, different in many ways from the rest of the nation. They were an enormously strong culture that was used to resisting pressure from above, which had for centuries never had a compatible relationship with the English crown. Uh, and when you put all those pieces together and you let them grow culturally and otherwise for a couple of generations out in the wilderness, they developed their own sense of America After the American Revolution, the people of the Southern Mountains spent the next century in a world apart, isolated by the ruggedness and remoteness of the region and by a stubborn independent streak. Then in 1873, journalist Will Wallace Harney published a magazine article entitled, A Strange Land and Peculiar People. He described Appalachia as a region out of step with the rest of America. Readers were riveted and soon more articles, books, and films about the so-called hillbillies were being churned out. More concerned with selling their products than painting an accurate picture, the media emphasized the most sensational aspects of mountain culture. Feuds topped the list. In the decades after the Civil War, poverty gripped much of Appalachia and bitter rivalries lingered from the war. Clan loyalty often spilled over into bloody family feuds. In the 1890s, a dozen violent feuds in Kentucky and West Virginia attracted national attention, including the infamous feud between the Hatfields and McCoys. At the same time the American public was getting its first slanted look at mountain culture through the media, the hill folk were getting their first taste of the industrial age. As new railroads penetrated even the most remote Appalachian backcountry. Cutting straight through the heart of the southern mountains is an engineering marvel the Clinchfield Railroad. 277 miles long, 55 tunnels, 80 trestles and bridges, 25 million cubic yards of rock and earth were moved to make way for it. One that would open up the back country to the 20th century and bring a new way of life to its people. Ever since I was a little kid, I've been interested in trains. My father-in-law worked on the railroad, certainly got me on and started. They've been good to me. I've raised five kids, and if I hadn't been for the railroad, I couldn't have done that. By the early 1900s, coal surpassed wood as America's main source of fuel. Used for everything from heating homes to power and industry, the combustible black rock was, by any standard, a hot item. By the fall of 1897, the demand for coal in the Northeast was outstripping supply, resulting in a quadrupling of the cost. With enormous profits to be made, 
venture capitalists set their sights on the Appalachian Mountains, where some of the nation's richest coal deposits sat ripe for the taking. There was just one hitch, how to get tons of rock out of one of the most inaccessible places in the country. George Carter, a Southern millionaire who owned extensive tracts of coal-rich land in Virginia, made it his life's work to solve that problem. He was basically trying to make the coal in Southwest Virginia valuable. Coal in the ground with no way to get it anywhere that people need it isn't worth a whole lot. In 1902, Carter and his investors announced an audacious plan to build a railroad through the mountains to reach the coal fields along the Clinch River in southwest Virginia. In order to connect up to the closest existing rail hub in South Carolina, they had to cut through four mountain ranges and traverse the most rugged and difficult terrain in the east. Construction began in 1902. To the hill folk, who had little exposure to the outside world beyond the mountains, the project resembled a full-scale military invasion. Many mountain men grabbed at the chance to earn hard cash. The work was all done by hand with hand tools, and these native people up here in the mountains, they were adapted to doing work with their hands because anything they had, they had to make it themselves. So they adapted very well to the construction work. But there weren't nearly enough locals for the job, so an army of workers had to be brought in from the outside. The railroad recruited new immigrants from the East Coast cities, primarily Italians and Eastern Europeans. Some were hired right off the boat. The onslaught of more than 3,000 immigrants, three quarters of the total workforce, was a shock to the native mountaineers most of whom had never laid eyes on a foreigner before. I think a lot of it was resentment of all those outsiders with their strange habits and strange language and everything. The locals down there, they were pretty clannish people. The construction camps were segregated by race and nationality. Each ethnic group had its own barracks, kitchen, cook, and often interpreter. In 1904, two years into the job, the crews faced their biggest obstacle, the steep and rugged Blue Ridge Mountains. To tackle the 40-mile stretch, engineers designed a system of long winding switchbacks and tunnels, producing a gentle grade of not more than 1.2%. That's an engineering masterpiece. The ridges around the mountains, they just cut through them. And the deep valleys between the mountains, they fill them. We have a lot of fields down there, 60, 70, and 80 feet deep. The Blue Ridge Crossing was hell for the workers. Shovel by shovelful, 4,000 men moved hundreds of tons of dirt and rock to grade the roadbed. On the mountainsides, dozens fell to their deaths or were buried under rock slides. There are many, many unmarked graves up and down the railroad right-of-way. A lot of the outside workers, there's no record as who they were, where they came from, who their next of kin was. And when they were killed there, all they could do was just bury them on the right-of-way. In the high peaks, workers tunneled straight through the mountains rather than going around them as other railroads did. In one epic 11-mile section, workers dug 17 tunnels through solid rock. The longest stretched nearly a mile. As the years of hard labor dragged on, the railroad workers grew restless. Violence and riots erupted along the line, killing dozens more men. The physical assault deepened in the mountains was accompanied by another, an assault on mountain culture. Conflicts with the outsiders' strange customs and ideas flared. In one North Carolina town in 1906, young immigrant workers tried befriending the local girls. Some residents didn't take too kindly to the advances. This is a sad story. I 
hate to tell it. The local boys waylaid a bunch of them one night, killed about five of them, and buried them in a 70-foot deep field that was under construction. The murders weren't revealed until months later. The construction crews had moved on, so the victims were left in their grave beneath the rails. In 1915, after 13 difficult years, railroad visionary George Carter drove the last spike. Having cost 200 lives and a billion and a half dollars in today's money, the Clinchfield Railroad was complete. Most of the immigrant labor force returned to the cities up north, but they left their legacy in the new railroad. The Clinchfield coming through here really opened the country up the coal up in uh, Virginia. The railroad made it accessible for them to mine it and ship it out. So it really uh, was a big boom to the economy of the area. The Clinchfield quickly became one of the most profitable rail lines in the country, and it's still successful today. Now owned by CSX, it hauls more than 150,000 tons of coal a day and employs nearly 1,000 people along the 300-mile route. The railroads meant a lot to us. They've been several hundred people from this area worked on the railroads and provided a good living for them all. The trains are still rolling through the same tunnels and over the same bridges built a century ago, a testament to innovative engineering and to the hard work and sacrifice of the hill folk and the strange outsiders who shook their world. Nothing's had a bigger impact on the people and landscape of Appalachia than a shiny black rock, coal. Nearly every mountain family has someone who's either been a miner or worked a coal-related job like railroads or riverboats. No doubt, coal's brought a lot of jobs and prosperity to the region, but that progress has come at a heavy price to the mountain people and their way of life. In southern West Virginia, an expedition of archaeologists is heading deep into the mountains. The hollow gets more and more narrow as you go up. You won't go all the way to the head of it. Today, the slopes of Blair Mountain are quiet and undisturbed but these men have come to search below the pristine surface for clues to a violent and bloody past. If you find thousands upon thousands of uh, spent cartridges, something went on, I mean, over such a long, long range of area too, you know. It pretty well stretches for like 15 miles uh, from one end of Spruce Fork Ridge to the other. So it's, it's pretty big. <laughs> This is the site of the biggest battle you've probably never heard of, the battle for Blair Mountain, the bloodiest uprising on U.S. soil since the Civil War. But this war wasn't about succession or slavery. It was about coal. It was an American incident that happened to happen here in Appalachia in southern West Virginia. But here was the culmination of a lot of angst and a lot of anger on both sides and uh, it found its outlet here at Blair Mountain. It took millions of years to turn the region's fossilized plant remains into bituminous or soft coal, but once its commercial potential was recognized in the mid-19th century, things changed quickly. By 1910, nearly 900 mines were built and in operation in West Virginia alone. It's still the state's biggest industry, employing 40,000. Ross Ballard comes from a long line of miners. It's very hard work. It's demanding work. You have to keep your head together at all times, be able to watch out for your buddy. He watches out for you. Uh, working underground is a, is a different occupation. It's a different world. The mines in West Virginia's coal fields were the most dangerous of all. In 1907, 
a roof collapse at the Monaga mine and killed 362 miners. Still the deadliest mine accident in American history. With a glut of cheap labor to hire from, the coal industry and big coal operators had little incentive to improve conditions. Miners lived in company-owned houses, shopped in company stores using company-issued credit, and signed contracts swearing they would never join the union. It was just a, an autocracy. They just, the whole machinery in southern West Virginia was under the thumb of the large capital combines that had come into West Virginia taken over. There's a texture and a fabric to the people in this region, so we will take a stand. We're good people and we're gonna take a stand on these, uh, on these issues. They didn't stand alone. By 1920, the 30-year-old United Mine Workers of America had unionized most of America's coal fields winning better conditions and wages for its members. Union miners earned up to 30% more and worked a shorter day than their unaffiliated brethren. <laughs> Alarmed by the union's success in West Virginia's northern coal fields, coal companies in the southern part of the state vowed to keep their mines union free by whatever means necessary. Mine owners put newspapers, politicians, and entire police forces on their payrolls and hired armies of so-called private detectives to rough up workers who dared even to speak about the union. The most notorious was the Baldwin Feltz Detective Agency. They were legal outlaws. They did whatever the company wanted. The company owned the courts, the politicians. So these henchmen had very little, uh, very little limitations. Uh, we were used to uh, men, uh, uh, people uh, that uh, didn't uh, believe in violence. Our people was fun loving people. And then when those thugs, we called them, came in, fear. Uh, fear started with us. Hilda's father, Bill McCoy, was a miner and a union man. She was just five years old in 1920 when the thugs came to town to terrorize the pro-union miners. They came a marching down with their guns on their shoulders and they started shooting at their house and everybody was uh, getting under the beds and behind the house and behind the chimney. It was like something like a war. McCoy and his fellow mine workers didn't stay in hiding for long. To them, a man's rights and dignity were worth fighting and dying for. Few men embodied that belief more than Sid Hatfield, the pro-union sheriff of the rough and tumble coal mine town of Matewan in non-union Mingo County. He was a rough guy, raised rough. He had worked in the coal mines, but very briefly. It is very probable that he killed several people outside of this gunfight, and that he was a very rough mountain man in the Hatfield-McCoy tradition. On May 19, 1920, 13 Baldwin Feltz detectives arrived in Matewan on the morning train. They had orders to evict union miners' families from company-owned housing. Mission accomplished. They set off to catch the train home when they were confronted by Sheriff Hatfield, Matewan's mayor, and a group of armed deputies. Hatfield threatened to arrest the detectives for bringing guns into his town. The Baldwin Feltz is saying, hey, we're the law, we're here legally, we've got warrants. And Sid is saying, yeah, I'm the law here, and you can't have these guns. So <laughs> just given human nature, I think there was nowhere else to go but a gunfight. No one knows who fired the first shot. But within seconds, seven Baldwin Feltz detectives were dead, as was Mate One's mayor, a deputy, and a bystander. Having met fire with fire, 
Sid Hatfeld had effectively rid his town of the thugs. They would not return to harass Matewan's miners again. Word of the Matewan massacre spread like a mine fire. Sid Hatfield became the mine worker's hero and a national celebrity. The victory was partial, but its effect was enormous. Hundreds of miners flocked to sign up for union membership. But the Baldwin Feltz detectives would soon have their revenge. On August 1st, 1921, Sid Hatfield and his deputy Ed Chambers arrived at the Welch, West Virginia courthouse to face trumped up gun possession charges. The guys did not have guns on them that day. They wanted to show that they were trying to obey the law by coming in there. As the lawmen and their wives climbed the courthouse stairs, 20 heavily armed men, mostly Baldwin Feltz detectives, emerged from the shadows and opened fire on the unarmed lawmen. seems that uh, Sid may have had as many as 17 bullets in him and Ed 14, uh, bad enough that they weren't able to embalm him. No one was ever charged with the cold-blooded murders, but if the goal was to scare off the miners, it didn't work. Sid's death fanned the flames of resentment and rebellion against the mining companies. From across southern West Virginia, thousands of miners poured out of the hills to stand up to the coal companies. They were not to be denied. In the summer of 1921, the brutal slain of Matewan Sheriff Sid Hatfield and Deputy Ed Chambers ignited the long smoldering hatred between the coal miners of West Virginia and the mine operators. The mine worker's hero, Sid Hatfield, was dead. But as cries for a mass uprising reached fever pitch, a new leader emerged from their ranks, 29-year-old champion coal loader, Bill Blizzard. Bill Blizzard had some serious arms and chest on him. A man could load some coal. And in that era, in that time, that was like a sports hero. You know, and uh, that's how he started working his way up through the ranks of the, the union men. The men knew him, and uh, they knew that he was loyal to them. They knew that he would do anything for them. He had a reputation, you know, fight at the drop of a hat, and sometimes you didn't have to drop the hat. On August 20th, 1921, hundreds of angry miners assembled just south of Charleston to start the 80-mile long march south to non-union Mingo County. Their objective? Break the big coal company's stranglehold on miners' rights and unionize the coal fields of southern West Virginia. To identify themselves, the men tied red bandanas around their necks. Now, a New York reporter seeing this coined the term redneck. It's the original origin of the word redneck. And at that time, if you were called a redneck, that you took that as a compliment you were a good, union, hard-working man. Miners joined the march from all directions. Most walked, some drove. One enterprising group even commandeered a train. By the time the armed men converged on the town of Madison, they numbered in the thousands. This is where the miners finally met up from those coming from the Charleston area out this way and met up with those coming on the train that they had commandeered coming this way. It was orderly. As orderly as 10,000 angry people can be, it, it was orderly. They were 50 miles from Mingo County, their destination. The Redneck Army would have to cross the desolate mountain range that served as the dividing line between Union and non-Union counties. Also standing in their way was Logan County Sheriff Don Chafin. Chafin, who was in the coal company's pocket, assembled a militia of 3,000 deputies and private security guards to keep the rising tide of marchers from crossing the border into Logan County. The 
the resourceful Chafin even formed his own makeshift Air Force, hiring three biplanes to conduct aerial reconnaissance of the marcher's progress and to drop tear gas and crude pipe bombs along their route. One fell into the backyard of 10-year-old Margaret Hager's family. They were trying to get the Union Hall. That's where they dropped that bomb and it didn't explode, but it did make a big hole. But the deadly tactics only serve to steal the redneck army's resolve. To me, it's the American spirit. Uh, you know, I've got a right to assemble. Now, you're not going to tell me I'm not going to assemble. And if you try to break that up, then I've got to fight back. By August 30th, Blizzard's army was nearing Blair Mountain, drawing ever closer to non-Union territory. Chafin's militia took up positions along the mountain's 10-mile ridge line, digging in with machine guns, Tommy guns, and high-powered rifles. With his troops armed only with hunting rifles and small caliber pistols, and with Chapin's men occupying the high ground, Blizzard realized the frontal assault would be suicide. He split his forces, hoping to outflank Chapin's men by using the thick underbrush of the mountainsides as cover. Against a hail of machine gun and rifle fire, the miners launched their assault. It was a time when men had to reach down inside themselves and pull out what they needed for courage to be able to march up that mountain as the bullets poured down on them. Uh, it, was a, it was a terrible, terrible time. Over the next three days, the miners on Blair Mountain tried again and again to gain ground, only to be driven back by the murderous enemy fire. Kenny King and his archaeology team have found more than 2,000 shell casings on this one short stretch of ridge alone. Seven. <laughs> Seven. OK, we got uh, raffle cases, uh, 30 out six probably, or 30 30s. Uh, most common will be 30 out six, because there was a machine gun set up here. We found seven shell casings there of exactly the same kind of rifle. So I can just imagine the guy shooting it, picking out the bullet, just shooting one after another. And there were more there. We just haven't found them all. On September 1st, after three days of intense fighting, President Warren Harding dispatched 2,100 National Guard troops to West Virginia to quell the violence. With federal troops on the way, Bill Blizzard finally ordered his men to stand down. I think my father realized that he was simply outgunned so much he was going to lose an awful lot of good coal miners. Five days after it had begun, the Battle of Blair Mountain was over. Fifty men, nearly all miners, lay dead. More than 500 marchers were arrested and jailed. The battlefront shifted to the state courts and to the court of public opinion. Bill Blizzard was the first to go on trial on charges of murder and treason. West Virginia prosecutors tried to paint him as a violent, bloodthirsty killer, but evidence from the battlefield showed otherwise. It wasn't until the Union brought into the courtroom and laid in front of everyone, including that jury, an unexploded bomb that the government had sent him. And uh, that pretty much turned the tide, I think. After eight days of deliberation, the jury reached its verdict, not guilty. My father was sitting beside me. He jumped straight up in the air and, and hopped up on a table right in front of me. <laughs> then they hopped my dad up on their shoulders and uh, hauled out of the courtroom with him all cheering and yelling. <laughs> The Battle of Blair Mountain and the exoneration of Bill Blizzard marked a turning point in public sentiment toward mine workers. While fear of communist influence in the labor movement had kept most Americans at a distance, the Redneck Army's fight generated sympathy and support for the Union cause. Well, they did right. You have to stand up. You may not win, but you have to stand up. 
Today, the mountain looks much the same as it did some 90 years ago. But coal companies are developing plans to blast away the top of the historic site to get at the 12 million tons of unmined coal that lie underneath. So the battle for Blair Mountain continues. Mining it will create jobs, but it also would mean that this historic battlefield would be erased from West Virginia forever. Faith runs deep like a river through Appalachia, and the water's wide, filled with a diverse mix of Christian faiths, dozens of different Pentecostal and holiness churches, and upwards of 80 separate Baptist faiths, each with its own unique tradition. But what they all share is a fundamental faith in the Word of God and a strong belief in the right to religious freedom. This is the story of one of those homegrown churches and its hundred year long fight to be allowed to practice what they preach. In small churches scattered through the mountains, speaking in tongues, drinking poison, and handling deadly serpents are sacred rites of worship. These men and women follow the literal word of God as set down in the book of Mark. And these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name shall they cast out devils. They shall speak with new tongues. They shall take up serpents. And if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. There's nothing goes on in this church that's not taken from the Bible. We don't add no rules or nothing. Yeah. If it's not in the Bible, then we don't accept it. For the last 100 years, these true believers, known as signs followers, have endured derision and risked arrest, jail, and even death to practice their beliefs. I am going to do what the laws of God is, and that's to take up servants if I want to take up servants. If I believe, I'll do it. Snake handlers are an extreme example of a hallowed Appalachian tradition, homegrown, fiercely independent churches that answer to no one but God. This tradition was born on the wild Appalachian frontier in the 1700s. Traveling preachers set up tents and invited all comers to join in raucous emotional communions. These emotionally uplifting experiences inspired communities to hold their own grassroots services. By 1900, Appalachia was home to hundreds of independent, non-denominational churches. Simple and unpretentious, they were as humble as the hill folk themselves. That fiercely democratic spirit lives on in today's mountain churches. If somebody's preaching against something and somebody doesn't like it, they go down the road to another building or build a little building and form another church. So it's real easy to do. That's how the snake handlers got their start a century ago. The mountains are thick with venomous snakes, and the Bible is full of references to deadly serpents. For one mountain man, this was no coincidence. It was a sign from God. In 1910, 30-year-old George Hensley, an ex-moonshiner, was studying the Bible to reform his sinful ways. The story goes that he went out walking in the mountains of eastern Tennessee, ruminating over the meaning of those disturbing verses in the book of Mark. And he was struggling and in, 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 in prayerfully meditating on the gospel of Mark's when suddenly there a rattlesnake appeared, and a, a fortuitous event, and Hensley picked it up and was amazed that he could handle it just exactly like the text said. It was a revelation, man enacting God's will on earth. You're in the mountains, you see a, a serpent there, and if you believe it's strong enough, you just go up there and pick him up, it won't hurt you. I think that's pretty powerful. Uh, the Word of God is powerful. Hensley began handling snakes in churches and revivals throughout the region. The 
practice caught on, and by the 1940s, the exuberant services were attracting thousands. At the time, with big outside companies increasingly controlling the land and people's lives in cold towns, the traditional fabric of mountain culture was being ripped apart. Strong religious faith helped hold it together. Sharing in forms of worship they themselves had created, the mountain people could find meaning in a world termed topsy-turvy. In 1955, at a revival in this makeshift barn church in Florida, George Hensley was bitten by a large rattler and died the next day. The coroner listed his death as suicide, but the faithful believed Hensley was in the hands of a higher power. Somehow God was in that. And what is greater evidence of obedience to God if that if you died, while taking up a serpent. So then your salvation is assured. No one who picks up a venomous snake doubts the danger. Dewey Chafin belongs to the oldest signs following church, located in Jolo, West Virginia. He began handling snakes in 1954, and his scars show just how seriously he takes the risk. And then that one, and then this. Throw this thumb in here. They, this is, this, there's more pain this than I've ever had on anything. Dude's been bit 168 times, or 170 times. He's been bit with black rattlers, yellow rattlers, copperheads, uh, cotton mouse, and God's took care of him every time. Dewey has nearly died many times over from venom poisoning. He's never received medical treatment, and he's always recovered. Many have not been so blessed. More than 100 people have died from snake bites during religious services. In the 1940s, a rash of deaths led the state of Tennessee to ban the practice. Georgia, North Carolina, and Virginia followed suit. Over the next 20 years, police repeatedly raided mountain churches and revivals, trying to stamp out what the authorities considered a dangerous, even deviant practice. But the handlers refused to back down and kept right on with their worship, defying the authorities. In the Appalachian Mountain, you have the, the more fundamentalist traditions would say that man's laws are fine, but they never can supersede God's laws. The struggle with the law came to a head in 1961 in West Virginia, when Dewey Chafin's sister was bitten during a service and died. In response, West Virginia lawmakers proposed legislation to outlaw snake handling. Still grieving, Dewey's family decided they must act. Dewey's family went to Charleston, and, and, and they was up for a long time at talking to them people and, and convincing them that's our, our right. See? We came out of here, for God come out of here. As far as the state was concerned, the law was not past his serpent handling. West Virginia is still the only state where snake handlers can practice without breaking the law. Today, only about 2,000 attend snake handling churches, compared to more than 3 million Southern Baptists and Pentecostals. Appalachians don't like people to think that Appalachia is full of serpent handlers, right? They don't want to be defined by serpent handling. But what they do do that a lot of other places don't do is they respect diversity and respect the handlers. None of them would be opposed to the serpent handling church being here, but none of them would support the practice. However small in numbers, the snake handlers are a potent symbol of the unshakable spirit of religious freedom and tolerance shared by the mountain people. The Appalachian Moonshiners produce more than just whiskey. To get the product to market, they built cars that could outrace the ones the police used to chase them. 
And in the hands of a high-spirited hell-raising family of hill folk, those souped-up jalopies came to be worth a lot more than the illegal spirits they transported. A summer Saturday in North Georgia. And that means one thing. It's race night at Livonia Speedway. Track owner Donnie Clack knows what draws these crowds in. It's the smell of the gas, the fumes, the engines, the, the noise, the racket, whether it be the popcorn, ball, peanuts, fried bologna sandwiches, or mud slanging in the air. Tonight we'll have the pits full, plus the Southern All-Stars. Maybe those antique cars, maybe we'll have more of those. This is hardcore dirt track stock car racing, the proving ground for NASCAR drivers of tomorrow. This redneck rebel invention was born on the red dirt roads of North Georgia. It was there that an outlaw trio of brothers, Bob, Fonty, and Tim Flock, broke laws, rules, and records to become the first family of stock car racing. Atlanta, Georgia in the 1930s. Prohibition was in full swing. So too was the making and selling of illegal booze. For Carl Flock, one of Atlanta's moonshine kingpins, business was booming. With more deliveries than he could handle, Carl recruited his reckless teenage brothers, Bob and Fonny, to run moonshine made in surrounding mountain towns to the big city. It was risky but lucrative work. They could make upwards of $100 a night but money wasn't the only draw. You know, working on the farm or working in the mill, a lot of these guys thought, God, I don't want to do that day after day. I want something to, I want to do something bigger with my life. And I think it also attracted guys who had a taste for speed and adventure. Bootleggers like the Flock Boys headed off each night on State Highway Number 9, nicknamed Thunder Road. It ran north from Atlanta to Dawsonville a tiny town that had almost as many illegal steals as it had legal residents. After packing their cars with hundreds of gallons of shine, Bob and Fawny would tear off down Route 9 back to Atlanta, often with police and revenue agents in hot pursuit. Their goal is to be chased in many ways because it is such a, you know, they, it, it is such an adrenaline rush for them. But to stay out of reach and out of prison, the boys needed more than adrenaline. With a little elbow grease and a whole lot of backwoods ingenuity, they transformed their mass-produced street cars into unbeatable speed machines. David Sosby's father was a whiskey hauler who drove a car just like this 1946 Ford. Our trooper car, or bootlegger's car, had to have the heavier springs under it for the heavy loads they'd carry where they wouldn't be broke down or set down so low for the law to make it very obvious that the car had a heavy load in it. They didn't come from Henry Ford like that. You got to put heavy duty tires, even the truck tires on them. And this car happens to have an Eldorado Cadillac engine with two fours and it put plenty of power for loaded cars to go on down the road. That give you another edge over the law. The outlaw whiskey trippers became local heroes. And it wasn't long before they were vying for the fastest car and driver bragging rights. And the Flock Brothers were prime contenders. All the guys would get together on Sunday afternoon and go out into a cornfield. And they'd get four or five, maybe 10 cars together. And people would bet which one is going to win. In bootlegging hot spots across the South, the crowds grew larger each week. Promoters took notice and began staging races at local fairgrounds and charging admission. Speed wasn't the only attraction. You really don't want to see anybody get killed, but the fact that there is an element of danger and the possibility that someone could get killed is part of the appeal.
safety features such as helmets and seat belts were scorned, as was sportsmanlike conduct. They were out there to win and they would do whatever it took, including bash the other guy off the track, hit him from behind. And a lot of battles developed on the racetrack that they would sometimes have to settle after the race, you know, with tire irons or pistols or whatever it took. In the no-holds-barred racing world of the 1940s, the aggressive Flock Brothers dominated the winner's circle. By 1947, 29-year-old Bob Flock had won more than 300 modified stock car races. That same year, Fonny, just 26, was named national stock car champion, winning seven out of 24 races. As Fonny roars across the finish line. Fonny was making a name for himself, and not just as a winning driver. What a man, 117 in a car, and twice as fast without one. He races in Bermuda shorts at times. He wears Argyle socks. He's got this pencil-thin mustache, you know, and he's got these kind of dashing good looks. You know, the women loved him, and the men all wanted to be him. In 1948, 23-year-old Tim Flock joined the fray and quickly began whooping his older brothers. Tim also proved he was better at grabbing headlines by making a rhesus monkey named Jocko Flocko his co-driver. They built a little C next to Tim, and they had a little safety belt and a little shoulder strap and got him a uniform, a little helmet thing to put on his head. The trio of super competitive siblings was a promoter's dream. Soon they were getting top billing as the fabulous flocks. They tell me that this whole family of flocks is a great uh, bunch of racers and uh, busy in all kinds of things that furnishes people with thrills, is that right? Well, we try to, yes, sir. What's yes. your mother think about all this? Well, my mother's got gray hair. <laughs> well, I don't wonder. <laughs> what do you think about all well, this? Well, I think they're wonderful. Do you? Yeah, I just keep my fingers crossed. It was time to go legit. In December 1947, Bob, Fonny, and 33 other top drivers formed the National Association for Stock Car Auto Racing, NASCAR, to regulate and promote the sport. NASCAR was taking off, but the sport's reckless pass was catching up with its pioneers. In the 1951 season finale, 33-year-old Bob Flock flipped his car and broke his neck and back. He recovered enough to claim one last win a year later before retiring, his mending neck still in a brace. In 1957, at the Southern 500, 36-year-old Fonny blew a tire and stalled on the track. Two cars plowed into him at full speed, killing one of the drivers. Fonny somehow survived his massive injuries, but he never raced again. Only Tim remained. Crowned NASCAR Grand National Champion in 1952 and 1955, he went on to win 40 races an amazing 21% of all those he entered, a record that still stands today. Serious injuries brought his brothers down, but for Tim, the showstopper was his own irrepressible rebelliousness. After rocketing to victory in the 1954 Daytona Grand National Race, he was disqualified for having extra solder on his carburetor screw, a NASCAR no-no. One sure way to get a hillbilly to do something is to tell him not to do it. The attitude was, don't tell me what I can and can't do to my car, I'm gonna do it. And if you tell me it's illegal, I'll try and do it without getting caught. Then in 1961, he ran afoul of NASCAR again when he tried to organize a union and win a portion of the race circuit profits for the drivers. NASCAR banned the star from stock car racing for life. One month before his death in 1998, NASCAR finally reconciled with its most rebellious son, naming Tim Flock one of its greatest drivers of all time. It was the end of stock car racing's free-willing pioneer era. 
but the audacious spirit of its first family still runs wild and deep at short tracks like Livonia Speedway, where the crowds still like their racing rough and their drivers fearless. We have this stereotype of Appalachian people that's sitting around the still and sipping moonshine and smoking the corn cob pipe and their feet propped up and their, you know, their head laid back on a hound dog or something like that. But these are very energetic, entrepreneurial people who desperately want to succeed. And this is the avenue that they find. During the Great Depression of the 1930s, the federal government chose Southern Appalachia as ground zero for the largest, most expensive public works project ever attempted in the nation, the Tennessee Valley Authority. It was, for once, an invasion of outsiders that many of the Hill folk welcomed. Rising out of the mountain wilderness of North Carolina is the highest dam east of the Mississippi. Towering 500 feet above the valley floor, Fontana Dam is the energy source for much of this isolated region. Uh, we generate about 300 megawatts. If you consider a 100 watt light bulb, uh, this dam can light uh, 3 million of them. Fontana Dam was one of 16 built by the Tennessee Valley Authority, or TVA, along the Tennessee River system to provide hydroelectric power and jobs for the hard scrabble region. Before Fontana Dam was completed in 1942, devastating floods plagued the area. The new dam would rein in the wild river and harness its power, but it would also mean dramatic change for the generation's old mountain culture. The people from the town of Fontana, which was just here behind me, would on nice uh, Sunday afternoon would go up and picnic on top of that little ridge. And just imagine the view back there with the Smoky Mountains in the backdrop. No wonder they called it Happy Top. It was a, a lovely place to grow up, and I grew up there during the Depression. Of course, it was hard times, but everybody was friendly. We never locked our doors, and everybody was family to you. December 1941, the U.S. declared war on Japan, and hydroelectric power was desperately needed to manufacture military equipment. Construction of the Fontana Dam began on January 1st, 1942, just three weeks after the Pearl Harbor attack. To rush the dam to completion, an army of 5,000 workers was recruited, with hundreds of mountain men from the Little Tennessee River Valley signing up. My dad had served in the First World War. My two brothers, they were very patriotic, and they thought, well, if it takes that to win the war, we'll do our part, and that's what we did. The dam site was in the western North Carolina mountains, just 60 miles from the largest aluminum manufacturing plant in the world. The Army needed warplanes, and Alcoa needed massive amounts of electricity to boost its production of a key structural component, aluminum. Within weeks, 150 local men were clearing 7,000 acres of spruce and pine forest. They were paid $5 a day, double the average wage in Appalachia. They wanted to work. They begged to work. And when these dam projects came along, it was like a godsend to all the people in the mountains. The dam would be made of poured concrete and constructed inside a steep-walled river gorge. To ensure a secure fit at the dam's edges, the slopes were stripped to bedrock and then dynamited to remove loose rock. Workers called high scalers descended the cliffs by rope to hand clear remaining rubble. For crews working on the riverbed 400 feet below, fallen debris was a constant and deadly threat. They'd holler as loud as they could, but so much background noise with the cranes and everything going that some of them probably never, never heard the warnings. In just 18 months, 
three men were killed and dozens more injured by constant rockfalls. One and a half years after construction began, the most difficult job was at hand, pouring the concrete. There was very much pressure to pour the concrete as quickly as possible since the concrete was the main ingredient in the entire dam. They worked 24 hours a day, seven days a week. As one of the workers said, we poured concrete all the time unless something broke and then by God, everybody went to fix it. After three long years of grueling, unrelenting work, the dam was nearing completion. But the most painful task was yet to come. The TVA had to transform the valley upstream into a giant 20 mile long reservoir. In the process, 11 towns would be flooded and 1,300 families would lose their homes and farms. TVA agents paid just $37 an acre one of the lowest prices paid for private lands in TVA history. TVA didn't always understand or appreciate the extent to which the land, however poor in quality it may have been, was a lifeline for the folks who lived here. They were just heartbroken. They had moved in here over 100 years ago. They'd carved out living in the wilderness and they'd improved the land, and now here it was going to be taken away from them, and they had never lived anywhere else. Ultimately, 53,000 acres were purchased, and more than 2,500 locals packed up and left. In November of 1944, the river began to rise behind the half-mile-wide wall of concrete. A centuries-old way of life disappeared under the tide of rising water. Even today, when Fontana Lake is low, ghostly remains of former towns and work camps can still be glimpsed below the surface. This was the Fontana Copper Mine Camp, which was actually the largest copper strike in the state of North Carolina. The people in the copper mine were actually the last ones to leave. They operated this up until the last minute when they had to start tearing out the railroad track before the lake was filled. On January 20th, 1945, the turbine generators began spinning. Electricity flowed to the Alcoa plant, which doubled its aluminum production in the final six months of the war. Unknown at the time, Power was also sent to a nearby top secret nuclear facility, the Oak Ridge Nuclear Lab, helping to speed its production of enriched uranium-235, the key ingredient in the nuclear bomb dropped on Hiroshima, Japan in August 1945. One old farmer, after the cat was out of the bag, he wrote to Oak Ridge, and said he wanted just a little bit of that nuclear stuff. He had some stumps out in his pasture he wanted to blow up. By the end of World War II, the migration out of Appalachia, begun during the Great Depression, became a flood of families in search of higher wages and a better life. Hundreds of thousands headed west to California and north to the industrial centers of the Midwest. In fact, the roads to cities like Detroit and Toledo were nicknamed hillbilly highways. As these hill folk fanned out across America, so did their southern mountain culture. Stock car racing, invented by outlaw bootleggers and backwoods dirt roads, has grown into one of the most popular spectator sports in America. Today, NASCAR draws more than 100 million television viewers in the United States alone. But perhaps the most enduring influence Appalachia has had on American culture has been through its music. It began with Celtic and English folk songs the mountain settlers brought from Britain, and then was blended over the centuries with gospel, old time, and bluegrass seasonings. Today, country music, once belittled as a hillbilly oddity, is the most popular radio format in the nation attracting 45 million listeners a week and selling 77 million albums a year. 
Country music, like other aspects of mountain culture, has transcended its regional roots to become a true American icon. Americans can take a look at themselves in the mirror and say, these people actually helped to shape the character out of what America is. The culture, the music, the way of life, the way people govern their lives as a law-abiding society, God-fearing with liberty, democracy, and independence. Ever since they first arrived in the Southern Mountains 300 years ago, the Hill Folk of Appalachia have been seen as a group apart, often mocked and misunderstood. But such attitudes didn't stop the Hill Folk who busied themselves with the building of America. Their qualities of toughness, self-reliance, willingness to fight and die for freedom turned out to be the very qualities that symbolized America. By sticking to their guns, their core values, and their way of life, the people of the Southern Mountains are no longer the other America. They, we, are America, plain and simple. I'm Billy Ray Cyrus for the History Channel. Thanks for watching.